The landscape is a living thing, not just the trees, the animals, the sage, but the stones, the very earth itself, the water. It is water that is at the root of the story of the village in which you now stand. The village has been historically known as Kuawa, but is known in the Karis language as Kua, which means south. Our people settled here next to the big river many, many years ago. It was a good place with good soil and plenty of water for growing the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. They built the first village out of the earth, and before long, the central location of the village saw it became an important nexus for trade between the Plains tribe and the civilizations far to the south in what is now Mexico and beyond. As the village grew prosperous and drought descended in the region, the people saw many surrounding communities descend on the village seeking refuge near the water. The village grew, was built and rebuilt many times, reflecting the growth of our population. We preferred to live close together, all within sight of the life-giving river. Life in the village was like any other. People ate together, hunted together, farmed together, made love, raised children, celebrated and worshipped together. The rhythms of life at Kuawa reflected the harmony of the people's relationship to the land, the plants, the animals, the weather. And so this cycle of life persisted for generations, a cosmopolitan crossroads and trade center, grown richer, more complex and diverse with every turn of the seasons, until the day strangers Stranger than most arrived with animals never seen and weapons unknown and powerful. What followed is a story of upheaval and change. The story of why Coronado came, what he did when he was up here is, is very important. But it's often perceived that once the Spanish story starts, the Pueblo story ends. And actually that's not true. The Pueblo story continues and what happens changes and so uh, we, when we tell the story we're not simply telling um, the European side of things we're telling the Native American side as well. It is possible that the peoples of Kuala knew of these adventurers clothed in steel astride beasts. There were long established trade routes that brought goods from the south from what is now Mexico and beyond. As goods travel so does news the people of Kuala were likely distantly aware of the upheavals already taking place amidst their trading partners to the south. When the Spanish finally did arrive in the area, tired, hungry, greedy for gold, desperate for supplies, and already hostile from encounters along the way, the clashes began almost immediately. Conflict over resources, our resources, led to warfare and temporary exile. The first violent encounter of 1540 caused much confusion and fear, but eventually the Spanish left. Years passed, and our hopes grew that they might never return. But they did, with more guns and horses, with new tools and new crops, and with wives and children. It starts out in Mexico, six-month journey to come into this region. Uh, so much of what um, people think is that it was focused specifically on finding gold, the seven cities of gold. And it seems like there was 400 different Europeans on this expedition and they all had a different personal interest. And it's the discovery of those different characters on the Entrada and what their history was and what they were looking for, how difficult it was for two cultures separated by vast amount of miles and a, an ocean, two distinctly different cultures coming together and how a simple act can create so much anxiety. For the Pueblo people after the harvest, they leave all of the corn in the fields, the, the stalks and such. For the Coronado and Trata coming into this region with animals that need to be fed, they're leaving all of their um, animals out in the fields and just letting them roam to eat. And the Pueblo people were aghast because that was their fuel for the winter. And how do you explain that when you don't have a common language? That something that simple 
could have such a negative impact for the Pueblo people who are living here. To watch all of their corn stock, which is what they would have needed to burn throughout the winter months, it's all gone. In 1598, the Spanish returned as settlers, taking some of the best farmland for themselves. They imposed a new form of government and demanded that we forget our religions and practice theirs instead. Our people left Coahuila and sought refuge in other places. We survived, though much was lost. This process continued under the Mexican government and a final cultural erasure was nearly achieved by the mass displacements of U.S. policy. By the late 1800s, Coahuila was nearly forgotten. Its adobe walls had long since melted into the ground and all that remained on the surface was a scatter of potsherds. In 1884, famed archeologist Adolf Bandelier rediscovered the site in an archeological context and Kwawa was reborn as a place of memory and mystery. Perhaps it was wishful thinking that caused Dr. Edgar L. Hewitt, the godfather of New Mexico archeology, span to identify Kwawa as the site of Coronado's main encampment. A man looking to place a capstone on his legacy, in time for a historic milestone sometimes overreaches, and Adolf Bandelier had already planted the seed for Hewitt's wishful thinking when he named the site Kwawa, a word meaning evergreen, implying a connection to the fragrant wood that Coronado had named his main camp for. Hewitt wanted to find Coronado's main encampment in time for the Cuatro Centennial celebrations of Coronado's arrival, and so he did, naming the site and rushing excavations, bending the rules of archaeological practice in his rush to prove his claims. A lack of evidence eventually tempered these claims considerably but the Kwawa site had a great surprise in store for its new caretakers. The rush to declare the site for Coronado turned out to be a fortunate accident, for resources were allocated to the Kwawa excavation and timetables accelerated. This commitment proved justified in retrospect, as archaeologists excavated what revealed itself to be an extensive complex of over 1,200 rooms spread over 10 acres along the river. Amidst the wealth of scientific discovery, they found a treasure like no other. What's important in this site is the Kiva experience and, and the wonderful murals, the only ones that, that exist in the world from a Kiva. And, and that's, that's the important story here, not 1,200 rooms that were excavated and then reburied. Uh, would I like to see some of those rooms? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And perhaps someday it will be possible uh, to do some more excavation and to have those rooms covered so they don't deteriorate and open, but I, I don't know when that would happen. A scientist by the name of Gordon Vivian, a graduate of the University of New Mexico's archaeology department, was serving as Dr. Hewitt's driver and field assistant during the excavation. As they started to work one particular area, Vivian's team uncovered unique pigmentation in a corner of the room they were clearing. As they worked carefully, removing buckets of earth, they slowly revealed a magnificent kiva, its walls covered with an astounding array of painted images. Even more incredible, the murals they could see were only the beginning. The walls of the mural kiva had been painted and repainted 85 times. Mindful of the importance of their discovery, the team set about devising ingenious solutions for carefully jacketing and removing the Kiva walls and transporting them on an overloaded truck. The truck counterweighted on the hood with brave scientists and workers holding sandbags gingerly made its way on unpaved roads to UNM where the painted layers could be carefully separated and the murals preserved. The import of the murals was immediately evident to the archaeological team at UNM and a great many advancements in the arts of preservation were developed to protect these fragile treasures. The Kuala excavation, now officially the Coronado Historic Site, entered history itself as the first state monument of New Mexico. In 1939, the site itself was filled back in to protect it 
when the deterioration of the excavated walls advanced too rapidly for anyone's liking. The study of the murals and other site artifacts continues off-site at facilities in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, teaching us about the people that lived here through the objects and the images they left behind. Even today, the scientific and cultural legacy of the murals carries over into the archaeological caretaking of Kuala Village and the study of its artifacts. As you will soon discover for yourself, the mural images themselves hold great power and mystery, calling directly and vividly across the centuries, an expressive testament to the great pre-Columbian world of the village. It should be remembered that the mural images are culturally protected images, and to be allowed to view them is a rare gift from the descendants of the diverse peoples that once lived at Kwawa, for whom they are active symbols. Those descendants still live in the surrounding communities and maintain traditions that connect them with the village and with the living images of the murals. You know, I, I think that there's always that fine line, you know, when you're interpreting uh, Native American artifacts, Native American art, or whatever it may be. I think you, what you have to do is respect those people. Get to know those people and to understand what they consider a secret, what they consider something so sacred that they don't want that information out there. And I think once you've learned that, you know where the line is. You know what you can talk about, and you know what you, you, you shouldn't talk about, because it's, it's their culture, it's their religion, and it should be what they should want to interpret or for us to say. As cultural stakeholders of the Coronado Historical Site, they help the caretakers navigate the path between educating the public and respecting the knowledge that infuses every aspect of this place above and below the ground. Just because this site was heavily excavated in the 30s and it's been studied for over 75 years doesn't mean that we know everything. Uh, we may never know everything about this site or about the people that lived here, uh, but as uh, archaeology develops, every generation comes up with brand new technologies that allow us to learn more and pull more information out of the ground and out of these artifacts. We preserve these things because we know that future generations will be able to do much more with them than what we can. So, you know, as you walk around the site today, you see lots of mounds of dirt, a very dry desert landscape. And so it's important for us to remember that when this village was occupied, it was a very rich and vibrant place. There was constantly human activity going around. You can imagine seeing little kids running around through the plazas, chasing dogs and turkeys, uh, people having celebrations, uh, the smell of food cooking. Um, you know, it was just, it was alive. And so it can be hard to uh, envision that when you're just looking at mounds of dirt, but that's something that's very important to think about. The Coronado Historic Site is a valuable link in a chain of knowledge about the people of this place and how they lived, stretching back to pre-Columbian times, offering insight into that most complex civilization and how it was transformed by successive waves of colonization.